what are we going to do today? We're going to review some books. We're going to review the best series I've read in forever. Forever. Forever, ever. We're going to review ever, ever. the Mad Adam trilogy, which is Oryx and Crake, The Year of the Flood, Mad Adam. I'm Yay. not holding these up for the whole video because fuck that. Um. <clears throat> All right. So I'm Scott. That's now we're Gunpowder Fiction and Plot. Uh, we talk about bookish stuff and complete nonsense. Your nonsense. No. Well, you're complete. <laughs> yes. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. Um. Today. Lose again. Uh, no, I gotta say, uh, make sure you like this video because it's gonna be awesome. Uh, and subscribe to our channel for more bookish content. There's a bell button over the side. Press that; it gives you lollies. <laughs> and I want to say thanks to all our subscribers for watching all that stuff all the time because you guys are up. We love our subscribers. If you press that subscribe button, you you're just in the love. You're in the, like, sunshine and candy section. Anyway, so today we're going to review the Mad Adam trilogy uh, by Margaret Atwood. Uh, I read these as part of my Margaret Atwood challenge, which is to read all of the Atwoods by April 2021. Um, and Scott read them because... They're people... there. <laughs> <laughs> because they existed. Uh, um, what genre would you say these are? Dystopian. Yeah, okay. Post-apocalyptic dystopian comedy. Um, well, look, Margaret Atwood doesn't like to stick to a genre, but if she did stick to a genre, it would be dystopian. Comedy. Yeah. <laughs> See, we don't even agree, do we? <laughs> says something about us that I'm like, it's dystopian. You're like, it's a comedy. It is a comedy. When was it published? 2003, 2009. 2013. Uh, and Oryx and Crake was nominated for both the Booker and the Orange Award, which I think is the Women's Award. The yeah, Orange Award. I believe you're correct. Synopsis. Well, how do you break the synopsis of this up? This is about... I, I don't think we can get... Like, without getting spoilery, this is about a post-apocalyptic environment. Well... Where... The... I guess we can talk about the world. The world is, like... Full of hybrid animals that we made with gene splicing and... and... Food security is a massive issue in this world. There's soy meat everywhere. There's like hyper-consumerist stuff going on. The corporations control the police force. Um, there's lots of stuff going on. Yeah, here. so uh, this is, if, you've, if you're a fan of Margaret Atwood, you know she can build a world. Well, she's certainly built one here. Um, and she's put some characters in it and then we hear their post-apocalypse and pre-apocalypse stories. That's really sort of what it's about. So something happens in this book and it's quite important. We'll call it the apocalypse. <laughs> and then this book goes back before the apocalypse and introduces new characters and then takes you through to those characters till after the apocalypse. And then this book, which is based after the apocalypse, spends a lot of its time talking about other characters and what they did before the apocalypse. Yeah, it's she's got no respect for a linear timeline. <laughs> no, uh. she doesn't. <laughs> and in fact, this book here, she has no respect for any sort of timeline whatsoever. Even the characters within it are just like, uh, yeah, yes. she, she's she like she's shuffled her notes. Uh, she, anyway. she upset Scott quite a lot. <laughs> uh, she, yeah, no, I, I really like these books. I, yeah. I wasn't upset by these books. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't even really notice the jumping around it. 
uh, as much as you do. Um, I'm trying to piece together a story, and I'm like, where does this go? I'm like... I think that's half the joy of, of a book that's not in order, is that it becomes... Like, whatever genre it's in, it also becomes a mystery. You're, like, trying to piece together the clues and figure out what happened. And this is cool. If I wanted a jigsaw puzzle, I'd get a jigsaw puzzle. I want a book. <laughs> you know, fun. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, what sort of style would you say she writes in? I think the joy of Margaret Atwood is every single book that she writes is different. Yeah. Um, and I think that's true even within this trilogy, like each book is, there's a cohesiveness, but each book is quite different from the other. Yes. Yeah. The world is the same. The characters are the same. Ish. Oh, sorry. Well, well there's continuity with the, the characters. The characters that are in the books that like, like. Yeah. The character. Yeah. Yeah, like when, when one character, when one of the characters from Oryx and Crakes appears in Mad Adams, for example, they're the same character. Yes. Um, so, but she was able to, to write a very different style. Um, I definitely think you were talking about comedy. I definitely think Mad Adam uh, is the funniest of the three. Yes, for sure. And I think that the first one, Oryx and Crake, actually has quite a lot of suspense around what happened and how how did the apocalypse go down and it's a bit of a thriller mystery sort of yeah sort of thing and definitely when we're talking about spoilers we're we're most i feel like we're mostly worried about spoiling that first book for people um yeah which is hard because that really does have an effect on the second and the third book yeah that one is definitely the most batshit of <laughs> the three if we're talking scott styles. did not like the middle one as much as the other two. Uh, no, I did not. Um, all right. So let's talk about some of the uh, themes and ideas that are in the book. Um, the first idea that we've got is the idea of biological consent. Now, what is biological consent? Well, it's the idea that your body can give consent for you um, as part of a sex act, I guess. Like sexual consent, intimacy consent. Um, and there are a species which are created through the many gene splicings that's going on in this world um, that signal when they come into the, the women signal when they come into heat by um, turning blue. Yeah, I that was actually quite good because then they, they use blue as a verb. Yes. Um, Oh, she's a bit blue. Yeah, which is, I think that's really funny because blue has often meant like, oh, that's a bit blue, like that joke's a bit blue. Like, uh, point, like the yes. word play, Margaret Atwood, jeepers. Well, but also, <laughs> blue can also mean sad, so I kind of... I'm all in a bit pms -y, I guess, you know? Yeah. Um... Um, but then the, the, the male of the species have like a similar, um like their response is to turn blue and have an erection <laughs> have a blue penis <laughs> um, which aside from being hilarious it talks it like waggles. <laughs> it, it does waggle but there's sort of this idea that 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 constitute can constitutes consent for this species which in humanity that's the equivalent of saying a man with an erection is consenting and that's not how it is for humanity. But for this species it was, and I thought that that was an interesting... It's almost... I think one of the things that Margaret Atwood is doing in this book a lot... If you lot, hear a low rumble, it is just our dog snoring his little head off. At least he's not jumping on us. Um, one of the things that Margaret Atwood does a lot is blur the line between animal and human. And I think this is just an example of her doing that, where she is, like, discussing animal consent with anthropomorphized or human yeah. characters. Yeah. Essentially. Um, like, on all the themes that she does, she, she links them together so well with her multi-layering... So much. Like, the fuck off, you can't be that good writer. Um, she just is. She just is. 
And I watched an interview with her in the last few months. Um, and she talked about her process and her her level of planning for a piece of work is is you cannot think that anything in there is in there by accident. It, it is all very well planned and decided before she begins writing. So interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. So one of the other things that we can discuss in this is at what point is violence justified and how much is pacifism a privileged stance? So there was so interesting how she talked about this because she talked about this on like so many levels where as far as like the violence goes, she she talked about it, you know, like you're post-apocalyptic, can you kill this guy in order to survive, ki you know, kill or be killed, that sort of scenario. But also, you're a vegetarian and it's after an apocalypse and you're going to have to eat meat now because you have to because that's the food that's available to you and, and like, the idea that vegetarianism is actually a privileged position to be in. Um, but, like, even down to, like, committing violence against plants and apologising to plants and thanking them for the nourishment that they give us and that sort of thing. Like, she, she never draws the line for you. It's always questioned it at every level. Um, and knowing that she's a vegetarian sort of adds to sort of your interpretation of those issues, I think. Yes. Well, a lot of what she has done she's uh, is actually something that the that um I I don't actually know which which it's one of the Native American clans do it in fact it might be many of them that they pray before they kill an animal's life and all of this sort of stuff I I don't I don't think it's unusual for for cultures who actually pay attention to like ecology um to express gratitude for the energy that they eat. But there's two really big examples I can think of where pacifism is yeah. like the characters are so pacifist, you know, um, where the characters are huge pacifists and, and they, like, they just get away with it and it's almost unexplained. But um, in the year of the flood, the character Adam and his, what he does to get Toby out of the burger place. Yeah. And and how that creates almost a riot, but he doesn't actually do yeah, anything. Yeah, he, he, he has the luxury of, of surviving by other people's violence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the Krakers in Mad Adam, how they can't protect themselves and yet they follow along on every adventure and remain unharmed <laughs> throughout the whole thing and never end up in peril's way. Wow. Um, and, you know, even the big threat, like even the pagoons and all that, they're like, oh no, we can, we can talk to them and communicate with them and they... Um, but I, th I think that that was part of the conversation. Like, I think that was, you know... Um... Avoiding violence by communication is is obviously a strategy, um, but it requires ongoing work and relationship building and that sort of thing. Uh, I I think that that was there as a, as a clear alternative to um, to the other big bad where they would they were gonna result in violence. It was it was always gonna result in violence. Um, and that that had to be a tactical decision, not a, a moral decision. Yeah. 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 All right. One of the things I really liked with this world is the wordplay that Margaret Atwood comes up with to create all of the animals. She has wolvogs in there, which are half wolves, half dogs. She has rakunks in there, which are uh, half rats, half uh, skunks. Um, and she has pagoons in there, which are actually a massively important character. That's a combination of the word pig and balloon, but she makes it pretty damn clear that it's not crossed with a balloon, it's crossed with a person. Yeah, it's a pig human. Um, and so you have 
you know, meet with human brains and and the opposite idea, you know, when you say Margaret Atwood takes it to the extreme one way, she's taken it to the extreme the other way. She's got, you know, over the top vegetarianism in the face of an apocalypse and starvation. And and then in the face of pre apocalypse, she's got consumption of human meat. Um, with these pagoons who are intelligent creatures um, and she makes it very clear that they're as intelligent as humans but they're, they're bred for their meat but also in the um, the special burgers she makes it very clear that the there's actually a bit of soil and grain going on yeah she's like it's any meat in fact if you have a heart attack on the street you'll just be picked up and put into a special burger yeah um, but it's it's an issue that, that definitely comes up again and again and again. Like, like at what point do you cross these lines? At what point is it important for us to, to eat meat? At what point is it important for us, so important for us to eat meat that it doesn't matter its source? Well, I think with the pagoons, she's also asking um, the question of... See, a lot of, like, because she's a vegetarian, she she will be asking the question of, well, why are you eating meat? Um, and a lot of people that are following this will eat meat, but they won't eat horse meat or dog meat for I, I, I definitely reason. think that, but I also think that she's raising the question of, like, as, as we go forward, there's things like lab meat coming to the fore and, like, faux meat is getting much more meat-like and... Like, all of those sort of products appeared in really extreme forms throughout. Yeah, the throughout. chicky knobs. Yeah, like, that was like a chicken plant. Yeah, and and they had the chicken breast that, that had a mouth on it, and that was all it was. And they yeah. could inject the mouth through, a, like, a teardropper thing. Yeah. Um, but, but it reminded me a lot of McChicken Nuggets, to be honest. Yes. <laughs> Um, it, I, I thought it was really interesting how she questioned it at every level and how it was just like pervasive. Like, every time they ate, there was a new question about food and where it came from and what the morals of that were, were and, and are we actually in a position where we're secure enough or where we're privileged enough that we can, that we can begin to reject the less humane things and... And that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you know what I think the interesting thing is? This, the whole veganism, vegetarian topic is something that will always divide people. But no matter what you think, Margaret Atwood agrees with you in this novel. And that's what she's doing with all issues. No matter what you think, you can actually say that Margaret Atwood agrees yeah, with you. Yeah, because I think what she does is she presents all the options and, and just throws them at you and makes you think about them and makes, like, I, I, I don't necessarily think she wants to make up your mind for you. I think she just wants to know that you're asking the goddamn questions. Which is the hallmark of a really good writer that you know, they'll ask. They're asking the question. They're not telling you the answer. Well, I... I mm, mm. You disagree. Well, I don't think that's always true. Well, no, okay. But it's, it's something that I quite like, somebody who presents all the information and then um celeste ung did it in little fires everywhere for example and that yeah. was a really good book yeah but you can't say that margaret atwood in this book is saying that capitalism is a good thing at any point but no matter what you think capitalism isn't a good thing N no <laughs> no <laughs> sorry but there are people who think that capitalism is the way um yeah and they're wealthy and this book definitely presents the idea that unchecked capitalism is a disaster. Well, it's a system of oppression, this, because the corpsey corps are the police. And the corpsey corps, if you haven't read the book, the corpsey corps are like the corporation of corporations, essentially. Like, yeah. They're all the corporations. Um, like McDonald's and IBM and Facebook got together. And they own the police. Yeah, the CIA of, of consumerism. Yeah. Yeah, and it's all a bit black hat and they can make you disappear and stuff. Yeah. 
Uh, and there's definitely some... And this is before the apocalypse happens. <laughs> yeah. In fact, in many ways, this is the cause of the apocalypse. I, I, and honestly, like, the apocalypse is actually a bit of, almost a bit of a relief from a lot of issue. Like, before the apocalypse, the society sort of, sort of reflects back at us a lot of the modern problems that we're facing and that are becoming critical and scary and terrifying now. Um, and after the apocalypse, all the all the issues become sort of fantasy land and it's a much nicer place to think. Yes. Um, it, and that's another interesting idea that she has, the idea that modern society, well, we're so obsessed with progress, but actually... Is it the best place to live? Yeah. And, like, there's certain facts, like, do you know that today you have to work longer to cover your rent or mortgage than you did if you were living in the 1400s as a peasant? Well, that just makes me want to, like, kill myself. That's capitalism for you. <laughs> Yay! Um, one of the things I really liked is when she's building this world, she, she like, she rips stuff out of our current reality. Because obviously, one of the things I'm assuming that every, all of our viewers will think or, or agree is that the whole point of a dystopian novel is not what it says about the dystopian world, but what it says about our current world. Yeah. Um, and, and that is what every dystopian novel is talking about. Um, and what... Atwood is doing when she's building these books is that she is ripping stuff out of this world and she's putting it with absolutely nuts things that she has I think exaggerated most of world. it comes from like originates with us and then she just makes it more extreme or puts it next to something that it's not normally next to yeah but she does it in such a way that you're you're suddenly you're questioning what's what's real and what's it definitely makes it scary as fuck. Like, it's... It adds to the intensity of the horror when, you, when you're face-to-face -face with the, the chicken beast that is a... You know, a, a living McNugget. Um, the, the parallels to our own society make that more gross and more terrifying and a bigger question. And I know that she's got, she's, she's out and out said about um, Handmaid's Tale and Testaments that there's no form of oppression in those books that doesn't exist in the real world. And I believe she has said similar things about her works in general, that everything begins with, particularly when it comes to oppression, this is things that, that have happened somewhere. Um, it all begins in fact. And, and a lot of these things, like you, you read about the, the splicing and the, like the, the harvesting of pigs for organs for human transplant and that all of this is stuff that we do. Like this is, this is not actually hugely science fiction. It's, it's a little more extreme. It's a little cartoonified, I guess, but. So with that in mind, how would you interpret the temporaries? What? The temporaries. They're, they're called the temporaries because they're temporary, as in temporarily alive. In the... Um, in Scales and Tales. In Scales and Tales. Or, I mean, like, that's... Uh, without having been in a position where I've been trafficked for sex, that's, you know, sex trafficking, you know how... That's how it works. Well, I can't imagine that those... That women who are bought and sold for under three figures uh, valued very highly as far as their life, you know? Wow, I didn't know it was sold for that cheap. Well, I mean, it depends on a lot of factors. Yeah. But, but in some instances, like, it's not even... Yeah, and this is not happening in a war. This is happening in... Yeah, this is just... This is the world that we live in. Yeah. Um, alright, what did you love about this? Oh, so much. I loved everything. I loved the characters. 
Um, I loved the world. I loved the sense of humor. Um, I was going to say, if you don't say the lols. Oh, then... there were so many lols. It was so funny. It was so, so funny. When Nell was reading this book, every, every now and then she's just laughing and I'm like looking I'm like what's funny what's funny and she's like the book the book, <laughs> the book she is just funny. kept pissing herself laughing <laughs> it was so funny such I a had good to book. change the sheets on the bed <laughs> um and um, what did you love about it oh I loved heaps um I I love I love a book that layers it because I'm a little bit slow when I with with books so I love a book that layers it because I get this layer and I'm like, I'm really enjoying the layer. And then suddenly I'm like, oh my God, there's another one underneath. And then there's another one underneath that. And then there's another one underneath that. You know, um, it was a real sort of lasagna book. Um, it's a total lasagna. I love everything that she's put into it. When you listen to it sounds absolutely insane like what is wrong with your imagination why did you come up with this and then you stop and you think about it and you go oh, actually it there it is you know like we just did with the temporaries yeah you know there it is bang um and and when we were planning this with the pagoons we're like well the, the pagoons are actually just an invert in, in inverse of humans getting pig organ transplants you know they're pigs with human organs um and everything comes back to this and that's just like we've said about it already but it's just so good it is so if you loved this series what else should they read well I mean, the the thing is, I feel like this is the destination book. Yeah, if you like dystopian books, read this trilogy. I think if you loved Hunger Games when you were a teenager and you're an adult now, yeah, read read this. Like, if yeah, if you're if you were a YA reader who loved Hunger Games and now you're an adult reader, read the Mad Adam trilogy. Um, if you have read. 1984 or Brave New World and you want to take it to the next level yeah I, I I can't think of a dystopian book that I've read that is as good as these um, In, including Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale and, and Testaments oh yeah this shit's all over Handmaid's Tale it, yeah this was this was a, a phenomenal creation yeah, this is this shit's all over the Handmaid's Tale for the feminism in it, let alone all the classist and the um, conspiratorial control stuff. And I don't, I don't know if that's true about feminism, but there is, there is feminist feminism in like it's a Margaret Atwood book. It's not going to ignore the roles of women, um, and a lot of our voices are women, and it. it you won't be disappointed if you follow, if you read Margaret Atwood for the women's. Um, things we didn't love. Well, uh, I think I loved everything in that book. I loved everything in that book. This book, right? Um, this book jumps around in time too much. It's confusing. And there's all these bloody hymn things. <laughs> He's just wrong. I'm just wrong. Um, the other thing that I didn't like is this as a trilogy. This should be just. This should just be a chunker. Yeah, I've got to say, um, the temptation. Try and resist the temptation to have a break between each book. Um, taking it's an immersive reality, and I think if you don't take yourself out of it, you'll enjoy the trilogy all the more. I think when we say it should be one book, we're not saying it should be shorter. We are saying don't take a break. Yeah, literally, like, rip the back cover and the front. Get a bit of glue. Just stick them together. <laughs> um, learn how to bind books. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I would say, like, my experience reading it, I read Oryx and Crake, thought it was fantastic, really felt like it was a complete story and that I didn't need to keep reading. And so just said, well, I'll get to the other books. When I get to the other books, I like Margaret Atwood, but I like other authors as well. 
And I had a real urgency after I finished Arcus and Craig to read the the next one. I picked it up literally within an hour of finishing Arcus and Craig. Well, it took me so long to get back into the world and and to just there's so many little things in in this book that there's terminology, there's you know the Wolvogs, for example, are a big component in the first book, but they're not that big a component in the second book. Um, there's so much, there's so much terminology and stuff. It's just, it took me so long to get back into that book, and then the fact that she's jumping about all over the place. Yeah, you're a bit of a grump about hard. that sort of timeline stuff, but if if you don't mind. Uh... A timeline that does some slow reveal by by moving backwards and forwards along a timeline, or having a dual timeline intertwined, or even maybe two or three dual timelines intertwined. Um, if you're cool with that, then then you shouldn't have a problem with it, it. I don't think it wasn't a big, it wasn't a huge deal for. I think it was beautifully done, um, but I I think you don't like that in general. No, I. I have a, a few little things that I don't like with books that I think other people would be like, what what on earth? And it's just that I find it a bit confusing and a bit harder to follow. I don't like episodic books, for example. Um, yeah, whereas I I, I love a, a, a dual timeline or a, or a slow reveal of a earlier plot. Yeah, yeah. And I... I don't understand why she shuffled the order and and it's Margaret Atwood, she's done it on purpose, but I don't see what she's gained. Whereas I, I definitely think it added to my enjoyment of the book. Um, but as as far as um, the weight of things we uh, I love versus the weight of things I don't love, then it's, it's definitely tipped in the favour of love. Yeah, I don't think that there was anything I really didn't love about this. Um, I just thought it was awesome. Yeah. All right, well, as a whole, I would rate this series five stars. Individually, I'd go three, five, three to the to the books. But as a whole... Three, five, three? Five, three, five. Five, three, five. You're right. I am. I've, uh, uh, I'm a bit dumb sometimes. Also, uh, numbers and letters and stuff don't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> says the mathematician um, who likes to review books yeah <laughs> yeah i i don't do stars but i i would say that this is probably one of the few things i've read this year that i will definitely reread at some point in my life um this was this was uh a nell classic i did i did love it um we publish videos on tuesdays thursdays and saturdays uh, please subscribe so that you don't miss any of them. Yeah. Tell us if you've read any of these, um, any of this trilogy. Have you read the whole trilogy? What did you think? Um, or what is your favourite Margaret Atwood book? Yeah. Yeah, even if you've not read Oryx and Crake and that, what's your, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting question. Um... That's all we've got to say, really. Um, yeah. Thanks for watching. Bye.